One of the abiding themes of art history is that every generation views the previous generation's art with a highly critical eye and a determination to produce something better, or at least something new. So, the classical Greek sculptors thought the archaic sculptors were too stiff, and check out those goofy smiles. The Hellenistic Greek sculptors thought the classical sculptors conveyed, conveyed works that were cold, emotionless, while the classical Roman sculptors thought the Hellenistic Greeks lacked dignity. The Renaissance artists called their predecessors Gothic or Barbarian, but let's face it, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, Titian, these guys are tough acts to follow, especially on their home turf, Italy. Nevertheless, the next generation rather bravely did decide to rebel. So, I'm kicking off this unit on Baroque art with the immediate heirs of the Italian High Renaissance, a period that art historians have somewhat confusingly labeled mannerism. It's kind of a way station between Renaissance and Baroque art. So, let's begin by considering the work of an artist who outlived most of his own generation and traveled the road from High Renaissance to mannerism in his own paintings. By the way, The Last Judgment is a very prominent element in the Sistine Chapel, it's a a which is a required work, but it's not one of the required images within the chapel. So, I don't know whether it'll be on the test, I want you to know about it anyway. So, on this slide we see two fresco paintings by Michelangelo, both painted for the Sistine Chapel, but painted 30 years apart. Of course, the subject matter is different, and The Last Judgment is inherently a rather grim topic. Still, what changes do you observe? In the earlier painting, God the Father appears powerful, but not really forbidding. In The Last Judgment, God the Son is a genuinely scary figure. Even by Michelangelo's standards, Christ's body is almost grotesquely muscled, powerful to the point of dangerous and threatening, especially since he's gazing down, not at the saved, but at the damned. Even his own mother, pictured behind him, seems to be cowering a little in Christ's presence. Unlike Eve in the earlier painting, who looks eager, if a little shy, as she rests under God's sheltering arm. It's very hard to see this huge and complex painting on a single slide, but I did want to give you a quick look at the entire composition. Note that we're seeing, in some ways, a return to the complex and crowded compositional style that we saw in Michelangelo's first ceiling fresco panel, The Flood, and which, as you know, he largely rejected for the rest of the ceiling. So here, by way of comparison, is Raphael's School of Athens, which may be the epitome of High Renaissance composition. So, what strikes you when you compare them? The Last Judgment is a lot busier, even frenetically busy. The figures are twisted, moving, dramatic. The effect of the School of Athens is soothing, rational. Michelangelo's painting, I would argue, is intended to unsettle the viewer and presumably turn our thoughts towards sin and its consequences. It is a much, much less confident and self-congratulatory painting. And as such, it reflects the spirit of the age. I'll get there. But first, let me note that one reason we find this painting unsettling, a reason you might not really think about it first, is its use of color. We haven't talked about color very much since our first unit, but let's take a look at this color wheel and pay special attention to the tertiary colors, the colors in between the complementary colors. Uh, excuse me, the secondary colors. These are not colors we really expect to see, and painters often use them to jar our senses, to startle, to unsettle us. So it's a little hard to pick out, but Michelangelo has moved toward a greater use of tertiary colors. This is characteristic of mannerist paintings. We find these colors, again, somewhat jarring, and that effect is entirely deliberate. So here we see a detail of the damned. Note the writhing, distorted figures, the sense of movement, the high drama and emotion. We are moving in to the Mannerist period, even the Baroque period. But by the Baroque era, and we're getting there very quickly, the church and its artists have regained their confidence. The paintings are dramatic, but they're not as unsettling, so stay tuned. 
So here is a detail of the painting, St. Bartholomew, who was martyred by having his skin flayed off. And we see him holding his own skin. But what's rather creepy is that most art historians think that Michelangelo has given the skin to Saint his own face. On the right, you see a contemporary portrait of Michelangelo. So what's going on here? Ha, I'm not going to tell you. Instead, I'm going to pause and let someone else answer. We're handling student presentations differently in this unit. Instead of leaving them for the end, we're interspersing your oral essay answers throughout the unit. So a brave soul has volunteered to start with this question, and I'm going to surrender the floor. The disembodied voice returns. Now, I have a big disadvantage here. I don't know what my students just, just heard, what you just said. So forgive me if some of this is repetition. By the time Michelangelo was painting The Last Judgment, life in Italy and Europe was pretty grim. The wars over whether Europe would be Protestant or Catholic got entangled with wars between two Catholic monarchs, Francis I of France and Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, over which one of them would rule the continent of Europe. Italy mostly just got ground up in the process. In 1527, Protestant German soldiers fighting for the Catholic Holy Roman Empire mutinied, since they hadn't been paid, and they marched on Rome. They spent several days killing, raping, and setting everything in their path on fire. Who cares? It's just Catholics, right? We also know from Michelangelo's letters and poems that he was deeply troubled by the turmoil in the church. There's some indications that he had sympathy with Luther's criticism of indulgences, although he never left the Catholic Church. As he grew older, Michelangelo was also increasingly plagued by a sense of his own sinfulness. And like Luther, he had serious doubts about his own salvation. Finally, Michelangelo was once again fighting with a papal patron. Now, at this point in history, the Catholic Church was actually, finally, taking Luther's call for reform seriously. The new non-Medici Pope, Paul III, had set out to end many of the abuses that had helped spark the Protestant Reformation. This was the Pope who convened the Council of Trent, which you read about in your homework. One of Pope, or will, I can't remember exactly when it was assigned. At any rate, one of Pope Paul III's reform efforts brought him into conflict with the now elderly Michelangelo. So let's watch a short clip about this. It's the only video today, I promise. So the term mannerism is actually a 20th century invention. And as you're going to discover in the spring, 20th century artists and art historians loved to invent isms. So we've had a glimpse of mannerist style in the form of Michelangelo's Last Judgment and an introduction to one element in its cultural context, the wars of religion and the Catholic Counter-Reformation. And we'll talk about more about that later. Another contextual element of mannerism was that these works were produced under the patronage of Italian princely courts, including the Medici, who were now raised to the status of nobility, and they were back in power in Florence. This was a world where elegant style often trumped rationalism, and where elegant artifice was honored above naturalism. It's a different world than the Platonic Academy of the earlier non-noble Medici. So this painting is not our required mannerist work, but it's a famous example that I could imagine showing up on your test. You read about mannerism in your homework, so time to show off. What mannerist elements do you see in this painting? Well, the Renaissance strove for a kind of realism, getting the bodies right, getting the proportions right, using mathematics, announcing the artist's interest in human beings and life here on earth by getting away from what they perceived as Gothic distortions. Distortions reappear in Michelangelo's Last Judgment, and they reappear in these courtly paintings as well. The hands and feet, for example, are often out of proportion and look almost boneless. 
Manners were actually obsessed with hands. In a lot of Manners paintings, we see beautiful, useless hands that were actually a sign of aristocratic status. The faces are often hiding their emotions from the world. Mannerist artists were also obsessed with masks. And an aristocratic culture where people deliberately masked their emotions and intentions. The whole painting is a rather chilled, emotionless quality. And that's also typical of courtly Mannerism. Okay, we're going to get to our required work, I promise. But first, I want to talk all too briefly about the painter whom I think is the most interesting and important mannerist, and who, alas, has disappeared from the course. El Greco just means the Greek. I put his real name up on the slide. But he is always referred to as El Greco. Born on the island of Crete and trained as a Byzantine icon painter, El Greco spent some time studying in Venice and taking in the works of Titian and his followers. But to my mind, El Greco, his Greek origins notwithstanding, is quintessentially Spanish. I've noticed that Mannerist Europe was entering an age of religious wars, but Spain had been on the front lines of religious warfare for a long, long time. Since the Muslims conquered the country in the 8th century, and it was only fully reconquered uh, in 1492. Spanish Catholicism was Crusader Catholicism, sharpened by 700 years of war to retake the country for Christendom. Spanish Catholicism was also heavily influenced by mystics, such as St. Teresa of Avila, who sought union with God and Christ through visions and spiritual discipline. And we'll see more of St. Teresa next class. This is probably El Greco's most famous painting. Since it's no longer on the list, I won't linger except to note that El Greco intriguingly divided his universe into a lower earthly sphere and a higher heavenly sphere. And he paints these two spheres very differently. Earth is more or less realistically portrayed. And in fact, we see El Greco's Venetian training in his use of light and color, but we also see such mannerist conventions as pale, elongated, aristocratic faces. But then those heavenly spheres just explode. Contorted shapes, jarring tertiary colors, whirling movement that contrasts especially strongly with those solemn still figures below. The spiritual world is more exciting than the earthly world, but it's a little unearthly, unworldly. This is a mannerist universe, but it's also one that's uniquely a universe created by El Greco. I could imagine you being able to ask to identify the mannerist elements in this work since it used to show up on the AP exam. Okay, I've really stuck this one in here because it's one of my personal favorites. But why might it be called a Mannerist landscape? Well, this is identifiably El Greco's hometown of Toledo. You see the cathedral there. Nevertheless, the space does not appear entirely real. It's almost like a dream of the city or the city seen through some kind of distorted lens. Now, I'm stretching to fit El Greco into my one day on mannerism, but in many ways, he defies categorization. Even though he was steeped in Catholic mysticism, I think El Greco's work have a modern feel. And it's not surprising that he enjoyed a revival in the 19th and 20th centuries, especially with the Expressionist school. That's the generation that rebelled against their moms and dads, the Impressionists. So check out this side-by-side -side comparison of the view from Toledo and Van Gogh's famous Starry Night. And here's a scene from Revelation painted by El Greco. That's St. John witnessing the opening of the fifth seal next to one of our required works by Picasso. Picasso was a huge admirer of El Greco. And here's the one I stuck in your workbook. Check out El Greco's rendition of one of our favorite scenes. So, okay, I told you we'd get here. Why the double title? The answer is, we don't really know if the painting depicts an entombment or deposition. Pintormo didn't leave us with a title. Uh, in fact, he doesn't leave us with any real useful spatial clues. Renaissance painters made much more effort to produce realistic settings and to create geometric uh, architectural uh, guides, if you will, to perspective. This descent seems to take place in a kind of artificial space. What other mannerist elements do you see? Well, notice how the bodies seem almost weightless. Who's supporting Christ? Isn't he heavy? The positioning of the legs, likewise, seems staged and unrealistic. 
while much more emotional than the Madonna with the long neck that we just saw, the emotion still, to me at least, seems posed, contrived, more theatric than real. Back to those masks again. And the colors again are startling, paler, more orange than red. In a few minutes, you're going to be comparing this to other earlier and later depictions of the same biblical scene. But first, I just want to flash a couple more Manners works at you to help you recognize the style if you get hit with an attribution question. You saw this on the Khan Academy video. I hope it's a fresco by Pintormo in the same chapel where the deposition entombment hangs. Note the elongated figures and the twisted bodies. And he guess who designed and built the chapel that houses both of these works? Brunelleschi. Branzino was an apprentice of Pintormo. Notice how he portrays skin almost as if it were a porcelain mask. In part, this reflects the aristocratic audience for Mannerist works. People who did not need to labor in the sun were pale. This is an even more famous work by Branzino. It's a portrait of Cosimo I's wife. Note Cosimo I Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, I should note. I see the porcelain face that emotionless, aristocratic calm, those boneless, elongated hands, and extremely elegant dress. The Medicis, by the way, were now the Grand Dukes of Tuscany and patrons of Pintormo and Bronzino. They just will not go away. Okay, Christ being removed from the cross and or laid in his tomb was a popular theme in Renaissance and Baroque art. It is a moment that captures, on the one hand, Christ's humanity, while on the other hand, it carries enormous spiritual power. It establishes a kind of connection between the earthly and the heavenly realms. So I'm going to shut up now and let you think about six different artistic renditions of this famous biblical moment. Ms. Jacobs is going to put you into groups. And each of you will get one of these works to analyze, along with some questions to direct your thinking, which are on your worksheet that I've reproduced here. And now I'm just going to flash the paintings. Note the date on this last one. 1917 is one year before World War I ended.